Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all. So as mentioned, the subject tonight is entitled Sustaining a Joyful Heart in Times of Adversity. Much easier said than done, as we all know. But to our master, Paramahansa Yogananda, nothing is too difficult, nothing is impossible. Everything he gives us in his teachings, along with his omnipresent help and blessings, is to be able to attain the unattainable and to do the so-called impossible. As he used to say, I would not tell you if it were not so. Yet at the same time, this topic potentially seems like an apparent contradiction. How, when things are going bad, can I be joyful? What's to be happy about? But the point is, we don't need to deny our feelings, our emotions, in any given situation, which are natural. But at the same time, we don't need to deny the perspective of our soul, of our true nature, either. It's integrating these two, our life's experiences, into an ever-growing experience of our true life. The perspective and realization that comes through meditation, through our master's teachings, that we are the immortal soul, eternal, ever untouched in our essence by any outer condition. And this idea of a joyful heart is an interesting one. If you were to look throughout the Guru's teachings, throughout the Bible, the Gita, in all the scriptures, and in the words of all the saints and poets alike, you would see that this word, this concept or entity of the heart is at the very heart of religion, of life itself. We know the heart can be spoken of in many different ways. We can have an understanding heart, a compassionate heart. We can have a cheerful heart, a grateful heart. We can have an open heart, a pure heart. Sri Dayamata in her book by the same name talks about entering the quiet heart. The heart can be trusting, selfless, above all loving, and so on. Now, at times, as we all know, we can also have a sorrowful heart or a cold, unfeeling heart. Our heart can be troubled. It can be restless. We can have a lonely heart. The heart can be mean. It can be closed. It can ache. At its worst, we talk about having a broken heart. But tonight, we're talking about a joyous heart. Yay. So, (laughs) don't worry. And more importantly... We're talking about how to maintain that undercurrent of joy, which Master says is our true nature, amidst the inevitable twists and turns of adversity that will be an inevitable part also of the outer dual nature of our human existence. I remember years back when I was just getting onto the path I read in our Master's teachings where he talked about seeing this world as a dream. And I thought, wow, this is great. Especially since I was only 16 years old at the time. I thought, what's to worry about anyway? This is a great philosophy. And on top of that, I thought, you know, this is also something my mother needs to learn as well. <laughs> so. Now, many of you have probably already attained a certain level of realization. And that is, don't try to convert everybody in your family right away. (laughs) Have you attained that first rung on the ladder of realization yet? The best way, as we know, is to change oneself. Then others might get interested. But I hadn't come to that realization just yet, but I was about to. (laughs) So I had it all planned. I normally got home from school before my mother got home from work, and I was like a tiger. I was ready to pounce on the first negative, just even a little bit of less than positive comment about something. And so I innocently asked when she arrived, I said, so, how was work today? (laughs) And as soon as there was the slightest opening, the slightest negative statement, true or not, I said, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's all a dream anyway. And I saw one of her eyebrows go up just a little bit. (laughs) She knew I was already starting to meditate. It was the 60s as well. But I didn't stop there. I really went deep into the dream nature of the world. (laughs) 
And so while she was changing, she listened patiently, quietly. But when she was done, she finally said, well, it all might be a dream, but either come into the kitchen and help me get dinner ready, or go dream somewhere else. <laughs> so, and I did, in fact, go into the kitchen. I helped with the dream dinner. So, so the point is, it indeed is all a dream, in the ultimate sense, as our master does explain. But as we also know, he said, if we hit our dream head against the dream wall, we're going to feel dream pain. <laughs> and that pain is very, very real, as we all know. So until we wake up from the dream, we need to keep our common sense about us. And then through meditation, through the Guru's guidance, we slowly start to understand about the nature of things, about how our minds and our hearts work and to start to separate the unreal from the real. And our master once said, there is no joy like that realization. In the winter 2013 issue of Self-Realization magazine, our president, Sri Mirlani Mata, said this. She said, you will find that the interior life is the only thing you have to cling to when the going gets rough on the spiritual path. If you have the ability to interiorize, to go within where you find that inner relationship with God and Guru and your real self, then no test, no difficulty, no amount of delusion can shake you from your spiritual striving. Your interior life becomes the only thing that is real to you. And though you live and move in the outer world, you are able to see it, as the Blessed Master has said, as just the dream or drama of God. To those who think it real, it is a nightmare. Those who know it as a dream see how to live and behave rightly so that the dream, through their instrumentality, can be made a little more beautiful, a little more peaceful. Such a one alleviates the nightmare for other suffering, struggling souls by his own understanding, by his own example. That is what the spiritual life is all about, getting away from the unreal and getting back to the real. And the only place you can find the real is in that interior life. You know, with regards to this idea of the essential dream nature of life, our master, as we know, often used the further analogy of comparing this world and our experience of it to a motion picture. And he told a story once how he went to a movie and he looked around in the theater and he saw everybody was gasping and reacting emotionally to the drama taking place on the screen. And how he then went up to where the film was being projected and then he saw while the reels were going around projecting that drama on the screen below, the projectionist was just there unaffectedly reading a book. And our master said in this he saw again that aspect where God, in his absolute sense, is not affected by his own creation, his own drama, the movies that he is projecting on the screen of life. But he is affected through his consciousness sleeping within each one of us. And this is why, besides the sheer enjoyment of movies, I think, why we like them so much, because inherent in that medium is the intuitive sense of how the universe itself functions. It's why I think dreams are so fascinating as well. At night when we sleep, we experience those dreams as real through our consciousness. And then we wake up and we laugh and go, ha, that was a dream, that was a good dream. But all we've done is slide from one dream into another, this one, without thinking it to be essentially the same. For instance, upon awakening, we wake up from a dream and we wake up in the bed and we uh, might feel the heaviness of the body and then so we try to lift this thing out of bed and then maybe there's some soreness or stiffness from the night's sleep and even though we may have experienced stiffness or soreness in the dream, we think, no, this is the real soreness. And then we step into the shower, we feel the hot or cold water, we get into the kitchen, we have some breakfast, we taste that muffin that we like so much, and right there in the tongue, it's all so real. It seems so, we're hypnotized. Guruji says that energy that's flowing through the nerves to the brain 
hypnotizes us into the absolute reality of this experience through the identification of our consciousness with those sensations. It's like how our master said, this universe is God's hobby. And then he added, but God is very serious about his hobby. It's why it seems so real. He's done a very, very, very good job. And so that's why meditation is that supreme practice that wakes us up from this dream where through pranayama, control of that same life energy that animates the body and the senses by which we experience the world, we start to slow the breath down and consequently the thoughts start to slow down, the mind becomes calm, and then that same energy starts to withdraw into the spine and brain. And then we start to feel in our hearts a vibration of peace or love or joy. It may just be a, a glimmer or a little ember of feeling to start with, but we immediately, we intuitively recognize, oh, that's me, that's who I am, that's what I want. We recognize it instantly. And then we want to go back into that peace or that joy or that love more and more. It's not escape. In fact, our master said, we have escaped. We've run away from our, our real home, from our true nature. So in reality, we're just getting back to our natural state, our true home and center in our hearts and in the expanded consciousness that follows. And then when our meditation is over, the problems are still there. The pain may still be there. That blueberry muffin is still waiting to be munched on and consumed. But our perception of these things has changed. There's a growing shift in how we experience those same situations and how we perceive those experiences. And yet, oddly enough, in that separation, we don't empathize any less. We don't enjoy something or someone's company any less but we don't identify ourselves with it to the same degree or in the same way. And that actually allows us, again, ironically, to enjoy the thing or feel compassion for something or someone even more. And so there's nothing wrong with the world that we have to get away from it, so to speak. It's beautiful. It's God's creation. But the great ones advise getting away from identifying our consciousness with the world, thinking, I'm this body, and knowing nothing of the soul, getting so caught up in the experiences relating to this physical form and our relation to the physical world. Otherwise, as Marilyn Ma said, it's great when we feel good, but a nightmare when we feel bad. It's like having a car and thinking, that's who I am, I'm the car. That would be ridiculous. It'd be all right, maybe, while the car's new, but <laughs> flat tire, or missing a spark plug or two, paint starts to peel off. The car is just how I get around, that's all. And so the same thing here with the body. It's a marvelous instrument. It's to be reverenced. It's unbelievable. It's to be cherished. But this is simply how we get around. Not to be mistaken that that's who I am. And so the masters have come to awaken us with the example of their lives, their teachings, their blessings. It's interesting and no accident probably that the documentary film that we're going to see tomorrow night is entitled what? Awake. Awake. It's perfect. It's a perfect title. So meditation that interior life, as Sri Mirlini Mata mentioned in that article from the magazine, is the first supreme way to sustain a joyous heart, to begin to reach that deeper perspective and understanding and reality. But another secret or way to sustain that feeling of joy, of connectedness to something greater, is where she also referred to alleviating the suffering dreams of others. Where perhaps in the midst of our pain, we care and look after others. There's a story about a man named Alexander Papaderos who grew up in a tiny Greek village on the island of Crete, which was affected, as were so many countries, 
in Europe by the major wars of the last century. And after the conflict was over, this was the Second World War in this case. He went on to become an Eastern Orthodox priest, and he created an institute on the island dedicated to forgiveness, healing the wounds of that war, to understanding, and to peace. And one time at the end of a two-week seminar, he was giving on Greek culture to some foreign students. He made the usual closing remarks and then asked, are there any questions? When I went to school, that was a signal where everybody keep quiet. <laughs> We had already enough of a lecture. But someone in the audience that day did ask a question, and the person telling the story said the answer is with him still. He asked, doctor, what is the meaning of life? And he said a fair amount of laughter followed, and people stirred to go, thinking it was just a joke. But he said the professor held up his hand and stilled the room. And he said he looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was truly serious, and seeing from my eyes that I was. And he replied, I will answer your question. And everyone got back into their seats. And he said the professor took his wallet out of his hip pocket, And he fished into a leather billfold and brought out a very small round mirror about the size of a quarter. And what the professor then said went like this. When I was a small child during the war, we were very poor, and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine, in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge is there, and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. And then he said, I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the dark places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of my life. And then he took his small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight streaming through the window and reflected them onto my face and onto my hands folded on the desk. Much of what I experienced in the way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry a small round mirror still. And then the professor asked, are there any other questions? <laughs> and so our master said this divine light is hidden in all, in each one of us. And again, our master's teachings on every page are filled with ways to behold that light, to live in that light, and to reflect that light more and more to all who cross our path. In the same vein, I saw some years back a so-called editor's note that is often on the inside page of a magazine. And this particular one was from the managing editor of Life magazine, which was a well-known magazine in the States that dated back into the 19th century, actually. And it's entitled Celebrating Janet. And it reads like this. It says, you probably never heard of Janet Berman, and there's no reason why you should have. She never made large amounts of money off the sweat of others, never made a movie or a record, never made a police blotter, never made trouble of any kind. In fact, she never did any of the things that pass for exceptional nowadays, unless you consider exceptional someone willing to put the needs of others before her own. 
With boundless enthusiasm, Janet taught her two boys, Elliot and Jake, how much life has to offer. She brought similar spirit to easing suffering in her hometown of Seattle. As a nurse in a children's bone marrow clinic, she witnessed lifetimes of pain, but she rarely let it get her or her patients down. On August 4th, she died in an unspeakably unfortunate van accident. We can only imagine how concerned Janet would have felt about the people she left behind, including her brother, David Friend, who is life's director of photography. Several years ago, David was working on a book called The Meaning of Life. At Janet's suggestion, he talked to her friend, Léa de Roulet, a social worker who counsels cancer patients. I am led to believe, Léa told David, that if there is a real purpose for any of us, it is to somehow enhance each other's humanity, to love, to touch others' lives, to put others in touch with basic human emotions, to know that you have made even one life breathe easier because you have lived. As David said in his eulogy at Janet's funeral, she might have as well been talking about Janet. The great poet John Donne wrote, any man's death diminishes me. The flip side is that any person's life can ennoble humankind. Janet Behrman was only 40 when she died, but she passed our way, and we are all a little bit better for it. And so these are these simple stories that, again, I think intuitively speak to our souls, to our hearts, which carry always deep truths. The simpler something is, often the deeper the truth will be that's connected with it. And it's familiar to us, and it speaks to the ultimate simplicity of life's message. And each one of us is capable of these extraordinary acts, these very simple but very profound and and deep acts of kindness and thoughtfulness and caring. Our master in one of his whispers from eternity wrote, and it's one of my favorites, O creator of all, in the garden of thy dreams, let me be a radiant flower. Or may I be a tiny star, held on the timeless thread of thy love as a twinkling bead in the vast necklace of thy heavens. Or give me the highest honor, the humblest place within thy heart. There I would behold the creation of the noblest visions of life. And so troubles we are all likely to have, I would go so far as to say that we will all have difficulties or possibly nightmares of our own, a terrible illness that perhaps just goes on and on, or the loss of a loved one or some other crisis or tragedy. And no one acknowledged this more than our beloved Sri Dayamata. And no one spoke more about how to bear those experiences with the right attitude and the right spirit. She said once, do not ever be afraid to face what comes to you. Whatever it is, confront it with courage, with faith in God. You have no idea what tremendous spiritual strength this brings. And she said, humanity is not intended to live in a state of being fearful. The original purpose of the instinct of fear was simply to alert us to be careful when we are coming close to something that may cause bodily harm. It thus helps us to avoid danger and serves as a necessary guidepost in our lives, one we should value. The person of real courage is not the one who never knows fear. One who never knows any fear may be brainless, without any sense at all. Rather, the courageous person is the one who faces his fears and advances in spite of them on the course prescribed by duty and wisdom. I always pray, Lord, I don't care what you give me or allow to come my way. I was thinking, this is quite a prayer. This is someone who is ready to Take on the whole universe. I always pray, she said, Lord, I don't care what you give me or allow to come my way. She said, I want to grow. 
I want to be able, Lord, to pass through whatever comes unshaken by it. And she says, to me, that attitude is the secret of courage. And then she goes on and concludes, many people say that a person who seeks God is just running away from life. Don't you believe it? After so many years of living this life, I can laugh at that kind of statement. To face the cross as Jesus did, to face the kind of struggles that our guru endured in striving to establish this work, this takes a person of divine strength and willpower and unconditional love. The individual who finds God is a spiritual warrior, as is so beautifully depicted in the great Bible of India, the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita describes the pursuit of God as a divine battle, a war that each individual needs to wage and win against the lower self, against ignorance. In fact, on this subject of sustaining a joyful heart in times of adversity, one of the books we know we have of Diamas Talks is basically entitled just that, Finding the Joy Within You. In all the various chapters of this book, she doesn't just talk about skipping along the pathway of life without any worries or cares. But rather, each article is again about these same truths, these same things, facing what we have to face, what's ours and what inevitably will come into our life. But again, with the attitude of a hero, with the attitude of a child of God. And in the chapter itself entitled The Perfect Joy, she in fact says, Spirituality lies not in the power to heal others, to perform miracles, or to astound the world with our wisdom, but in the ability to endure with right attitude whatever crosses we have to face in our daily lives and thus to rise above them. Reading that again, she said, spirituality lies not in the power to heal others, to perform miracles, or to astound the world with our wisdom, but in the ability to endure with right attitude whatever crosses we have to face in our daily lives and thus to rise above them. And she said, this spirit bestows all conquering strength and supreme happiness. And so this is what leads to that joy that is in the title. This is what leads to lasting happiness, lasting contentment, lasting peace, lasting understanding. So as Daima once said, trials will come, don't be afraid of them. But then she added, but don't ask for them either. <laughs> so that's also Ma. And speaking about Jesus, as Ma was referencing, no one stayed more in his heart, more centered in his heart during times of adversity than did he. As our master said, Christ showed the mightiest miracle of love when while being crucified, he uttered with full sincerity and realization those immortal words which will ring until the end of time, forgive them for they know not what they do. Imagine being there in that movie, in that drama, witnessing that in those words that example of that ultimate love and understanding. Thinking of this once, I thought, what if Jesus hadn't responded in that way? We know there was that moment where he said, don't you know in this very instant I could send a legion of angels to destroy you all? And I thought, what if he had done that? <laughs> I don't know what you think about, but sometimes I think about something like that. <laughs> If he did, we'd probably say, you know, he was great. He could do miracles, he could walk on water, he could raise the dead, but don't get him angry. <laughs> huh? Or watch out, you know, zap, your legion of angels come flying at you. No, it's because he didn't act in that way that we love him, that we could never fear him, that we'll follow him to the end of time, that these words will ring true in every age, because he demonstrated, as Ma said, that true spirituality, that perfect attunement that is the true source of those powers, 
of those miraculous demonstrations. It's like I, I heard the Dalai Lama once say, you may have heard this quote. He said once, my religion is simple. My religion is kindness. I thought, it's so beautiful. It's so simple. But then I read once somewhere else, he, he also meditates hours every day. He doesn't just go around being kind in that sense or being good. Uh, he does. But it's, it's in that meditation, again, in that interior life, that we will find the strength to be good, to be kind, to be like these great souls that we cherish, that we love, that we follow. Perhaps the ultimate adversity or most challenging experience of this dream world is that dream of death, which our master referred to in the Gita as the final examination in this school of life, the eventual loss of this body or the body of a loved one. We all have our unique karma, even in the ashram. We're not exempt from our karma. And I happen to have had the unusual karma as a monastic, to have been present when both my parents passed away. It was also made possible by the fact that they were living near Encinitas toward those last years of their life. And of course, this was understandably very moving, such a gift to witness, to be there at that moment of their passing. And I've never thought this to be strictly personal. I always felt that it took place because it was meant to be a benefit to my service in the ashram. I think it may not have taken place otherwise if, if there hadn't been multiple reasons for, for that karma to manifest. Dayama gave me permission to look after them in those last few years best I could while juggling everything else at the same time. And I remember in the case of my father, I was... I had my hand on his forehead and I was holding his hand with the other. And as the intervals of breathing became slower and slower, and toward the end it was like watching a perfect hong saw. And it just slowly, more slowly, and then, then toward the end there was just the tiniest reflex. And then one moment to the next, he was gone. And from one moment to the next, there was this joy in the room, this sense of freedom, and I wasn't looking for it. Everything leading up to those perfect Hong Saws wasn't so peaceful, so wonderful in that sense. It was a surprise. Even though we hear about these things, I don't think we think about those things at that moment. But then it's almost like a universal experience that there's this feeling like, Ah, oh, there's this peace, there's a, something larger than this physical form. My mother was sitting on the other side of the room in the hospital there, and I looked up and I, I said, Mom, I think Dad's gone. And she got up, she was quite frail herself at the time. She made her way around the bed, I stepped back so that she gave her room to come over to my dad. And then it was so cute. It was, it was like the summation of their 60 years of marriage. She leaned over and she gave him the most beautiful kiss I had ever seen in my whole life. And then she pulled back slightly and, and she was still right up against his face. And then she said, as if there was nobody else in the room, she said, you haven't seen the last of me yet, you rascal. <laughs> I mean, he's dead. And she's, she's still giving him the business, you know? <laughs> and it was somewhere between a loving promise and a threat. I wasn't, quite, I wasn't quite sure. A little of both. Probably after these stories, I, I I'll probably haven't seen the last of her either. No, she was, those who knew she was wonderful, that's why I dare to tell these stories. You know, a few years later, my mom was getting closer to making good on her promise to uh, see the rascal, my dad. And so I was sitting in the chair next to her bed. It was in the same hospital, in fact. And I had brought some of my ashram work with me. I had my laptop, and, and, uh, because I didn't know how long things might... You never know. You never know how things, things go. But then after a few hours, I saw it was that same pattern of breathing where the breaths were gone so slow. And I thought, oh, yeah, that, I remember seeing that with, with my dad. And so I thought, okay, she's getting toward the end. Now, she had been basically in a coma for 
a week or so. She had no movement, eyes closed, just lying in bed. And so I, I saw the breathing was going slower, so I, I leaned in and I whispered in her ear, I love you, Mom, and what a great mother you've been. And, and, uh, and then I said, and if you see some light, just, just merge into that light, just merge into that peace. And then, like I say, she had been basically unconscious for a few days. So I'm leaning and saying all that, eyes closed, no movement. And as I was talking to her, with her eyes still closed, she lifted up her arm and with strength, she pushed me away. <laughs> it was as if I could hear in my mind, just as clear as a bell, she was saying, listen, little boy, I came into the world by myself and I'm going out by myself. And I don't need you telling me about merging into any light. I, I was just like words were coming to me. And I just stood back and I said, all right, you go, girl. You know? <laughs> now, I'm here if you need me. So there she is. She's lying in a bed. She just had two strokes. She's in a coma. But if, you know, if you need any help, I'll just, be, I'll just be right here, right by your side. So... Mothers, you know, whoever you are, wherever you are, I bow to you. <laughs> Let's bow to the mothers that are here. They're wonderful. And then if that wasn't enough, I could, again, sense as if then, then new words came in in my mind. Besides, she's, I, I could just, Daima wouldn't want you wasting your time. You just sit back down there and you keep busy. So it's like, okay, you know, I had two mothers to deal with. So... <laughs> And then two more days went by until she took that last breath. And I saw it with my mom and dad. There's, it's, so, it's, so, uh, it's not easy. Those of us who have been in those situations, we know, but it's something that's so beautiful. It's so filled with the presence of God and Guru. It doesn't just happen by accident. There's no accidents in those last few moments at all. So this isn't, it's obviously personal, but that's not the purpose of telling the story. It's not about me or my family. It's about you. It's about you and your family. It's about the people that cross your path. It's about celebrating the people in your lives, being there for them. It's about celebrating the human spirit. That's the purpose of sharing that kind of story. Because each family is unique. Each family is beautiful. Why? Because because God's writing the script of each one of our lives, and it's unique. It's similar in so many ways because it's similarly beautiful, similarly moving or instructive. And again, everything wasn't all fun and games. Hardly. You know, I'm drawing out that one aspect of the experience, but everything leading up to that, those weeks and months and years, was not always pleasant or funny as, again, those of us that have been in those situations know. But that's what Gyanamada meant when she said, the cold, hard light of day. And there's always exceptions. Maybe there's not a lot to celebrate in a particular uh, situation. Or maybe we need some additional professional help to help us get through a situation or to cope with the particular experience. But the point is, as our Master said, in the end, all will be well. The soul rises up and is victorious. No matter what the situation, you will make it. It will be okay. As our master said, God will not allow you to be tested more than you are able to bear. Sometimes people might say, no, I, it was too much and we couldn't take it. It can seem that way possibly at the moment, at a particular time, but that's still looking at just a portion of the experience. It's not looking at the whole experience. It may just be a necessary part of the journey that's still to come, that's still to follow, that's still to impart. That experience itself may come to impart incredible meaning and understanding and wisdom in our lives. So if that happens, it's just a, a temporary pause or new challenge to gain further strength before starting up again. To God, the experience didn't end. It's still happening. It's still there, still wanting to teach us. It's just still more of that shadow of the valley that we might be in at the time, that's spoken of in the 23rd Psalm. But what does the rest of that 
Psalm say? It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That rod and staff of the spine of our meditations. Thou preparest a table in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. That's the conclusion that awaits us. That's what we will all experience when we emerge from that shadow. Now, I was remembering just that day, and I found where Daima said something once connected to this. She said, Guru Dev Paramahansa Yogananda taught us to look upon every difficulty as the shadow of God's hand outstretched in blessing. This is very interesting, very beautiful. First is the so-called shadow, where again, there's such potential meaning, such growth, such wealth and understanding, and which makes us receptive and ready to receive and absorb the blessing that is at that moment coming our way. You probably all, we've probably all experienced this. Someone, they mean to give us a nice pat, but we, we think they're going to poke us. And so, in a way, when we're in that shadow, in that darkness, we might interpret, oh, that hand, it's coming to hit me. But instead, no, it's coming to caress us. But as it comes, there's that temporary shadow that precedes that light, pre- precedes that blessing from God or Guru. And this is something that at times can affect all of us, even after years on the path, that temporary shadow or so-called dark night of the soul, where we might feel in our experience that God or Guru have abandoned us. But that's impossible. Because God or Spirit cannot abandon itself. It can't abandon its own nature, its own self, its own creation, us, that creation of that spirit. They want only one thing from us, to make us like themselves. And in the darkness is often the only way that we'll pull out of ourselves and recognize the strength that's in us, that's wanting to come forth, that can't come forth in any other way. And so their help is there just as much in the shadow, only it's hidden because we can't see it in that darkness. And so that's the temptation, that's the doubt that it's not there. We have to remind ourselves, and that's when we really live the spiritual life. That's when we're walking in the footsteps of these great ones because they've all walked that path. They've walked through that shadow at times. They've, They've been tested. That's what Maz talks about all the time. Our master thinks so much of us He says, we can do it too. And a situation is created that we might recognize that same divinity within ourselves through that experience. And so their help is there just as much, preparing us for the light, preparing us for the blessing that they're just waiting, that's just around the corner to be bestowed. Of course, I've been mentioning about the importance of meditation, and we know this. This is the Master's teachings. But we also know there may be times in our life if we're going through a very intense test or trial that we may not be able to practice to the same degree. Then we do what we can and we offer what we can to God. And we should realize that He judges according to a much different standard than we do or those around us. And if we've given our best, even if it's barely nothing, but if it's the best that we can give under the circumstances, then to him, it's pure gold. As our president, Mary Ma, once said, if you love God to the best of your ability, your love is already perfect in his eyes. So we should never forget that. So God and the masters, they, they can't take away all the suffering and discomfort, the experience or adversity itself. That's not what they do. That's not how they help. Sometimes, yes, of course, there might be a particular healing that God ordains in our life or in the life of a loved one. But 
more often than not, at least in my own case, or for instance, in the, in the case of my parents that I was talking about, I saw how that help came in a thousand different ways. Perhaps in resolving some life issue toward the end, or even helping with the transition itself. And I thought, what's the point of, of healing that body in that instant when we have to leave it behind in any case? Rather, again, it's the healing of the mind and soul through that experience, helping us to find a glimmer of joy amidst the adversities of life. That's, that's the healing. That's the, the blessing. That's what we take with us. As we may have observed, it's so common that toward those final moments, the breath is anything but calm many times. But I was, you know, with my folks, I realized, you know, the body's just still serving us right to the end. You know, the brain's getting the message, there's not enough oxygen. So what does it do? It's sending a signal. Try to, try to breathe deeper to get the oxygen, to, to, to continue to serve us. This body is just serving us all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't trying to punish it was just, it was, it was doing according to its nature. It was trying to help. And again, when they were gone, it was like, wow, they were never those lungs in the first place. They were never that form in the first place. As was mentioned, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of our former beloved president, Sri Dayamata. And no one taught us these truths by the example of her life more than Dayama herself, who we honor especially this convocation. We might recall some of Sri Mirlani Ma's intimate words about those last days of Dayama's life and how she kept her attunement, her love, her love for God, her love for all of us, still fully present, still the, the absolute focus of her life. And perhaps to relate one last story along these same lines, in those days following Ma's passing, I had the responsibility with a number of others to help coordinate with Forest Lawn as to the details of the public viewing that many of you probably came to. And as it related also first to the memorial service at Pasadena for the public and then a separate service held at the Mother Center for the monastics. And as is customary, Often a member of the family, so to speak, will ride up front in the hearse on the passenger side. And circumstances were such that at the last minute it ended up being me. We planned as much as we could, but we didn't, we didn't think of everything. So at the end of the final service held for the monastics, as the car slowly made its way down the main drive at the mother center, monks and nuns were on either side of the car throwing rose petals as the car slowly went its way in the darkness toward the main gate and then out. And it was truly like a, a scene out of time. And so as we slowly made our way to Forest Lawn, it was about 15 minutes or so from the mother center, the gentleman who was driving and who had helped us through all these several days, he was, he was commenting how how marvelous Self-Realization Fellowship was, how wonderful our founder must have been to have attracted so many wonderful souls like Dayama and, and then all the members that he had met through those few days. And as we got a little closer to Forest Lawn, I told him from our side how special Forest Lawn had been to us through the years. And of course, with our master's crypt being there, which he said he also was familiar with. And then as we drove across the threshold of the entrance there, at the entrance gate, he slowed the car down and he turned to me and he said, would you like it if we drove past Yogananda's crypt before we park? I said, oh, that idea hadn't occurred to me. I thought, that'd be wonderful. So he continued up the hill there slowly and then he went around to the left side of the great mausoleum, which houses our master's form. And then as we passed adjacent to the entrance on the right side of the building where you would go in to, to visit Master's Crypt. I was filled with such feeling, and I, I grabbed his arm, and I said, you have no idea how, how much this would mean to Dayama to honor her teacher like this. And then he replied, well, she probably dropped the thought in my mind, and I picked it up. <laughs> and I thought, thank goodness somebody picked it up. Because <laughs> I hadn't. Maybe she was trying to like pound it into me like for about 15 minutes, finally said, ay, ay, ay. so, you know, 
And then, bang, you know, the guy said, huh, what if we, why don't we, why don't we drive by the crypt? What do you think of that? And then he slowly drove around the other side, and then I and, and, and the monks that were in the car following, we were immediately struck with the idea that, the thought that as Ma's last act, she was circumambulating the guru in that clockwise fashion according to the route that the driver had taken. And this is that act common in virtually all religions of going around a sacred object, and in this case, one's guru. And it was as if Ma was still showing us, even in so-called death, the way to live, how to respect and reverence the path, the guru, life itself. And then slowly the driver started to return back down the hill to the private area behind the main entrance where he was to park. And then we all got out, and again, if what had just happened wasn't enough, we all happened to go around the back of the hearse, and we saw that the rear bumper was just layered, still full of the rose petals that had been thrown back at Mother Center. Somehow in all that driving, they hadn't blown off. And it, it looked like a divine carriage, like we see just married, you know, <laughs> except in this case, to the divine. And so we are part of all this. We were part of this incredibly beautiful spiritual family with our guru at the head that spans all the three worlds and beyond this beautiful fellowship of souls, of divine friends. And it therefore gives hope and assurance and support that we can do it too. That we can at least strive to do this, strive to live in this way, to follow in the footsteps of our guru and his great disciples. Knowing, as our master said, that God watches the heart. He watches, he cares most, he judges by the sincerity of our hearts. Which is why our master said that effort is progress. That's a good quote to write down when we're feeling blue. That effort is progress. It's not the result necessarily, but the effort to achieve that result. Because what does that effort embody? It, it, it shows we care, that we love, that we're in love. Of course God watches the heart. I think we all know intuitively that's why we're here. That could be the only reason, it seems, we might feel why we're here, that we didn't necessarily earn it or deserve it, but because it's all about the heart. It's all about, we do the effort, we make the effort, it's we take it seriously, we need to, but we know we can't do it alone anyway. We can only do it with the help and blessing and grace of God and Guru. But it's that sincerity of purpose and our love for them that brings that grace, that brings that result. You know, every now and then we'll get a misspelled request for some item offered in the SRF catalog. And once, instead of man's eternal quest, that collection of talks by our guru, someone instead mistakenly wrote in asking to purchase a copy of man's infernal quest. <laughs> yeah. well, as we said in the beginning, it may feel that way sometimes. But no, it's that quest for eternity of our rightful place in the universe. And in time of that growing realization of our ever new, ever joyous awakening of our true and immortal soul nature. So in closing, our master sums up this quest in something he wrote on the very last page of his equally timeless autobiography of a yogi. Where at the end of all those stories, all those words, all those experiences, he similarly sums up that journey and writes, God is love. His plan for creation can be rooted only in love. Does not that simple thought, rather than erudite reasonings, offer solace to the human heart? Every saint who has penetrated to the core of reality has testified that a divine universal plan exists and that it is beautiful and full of joy. 
And so let us realize more than ever that this plan that Guruji talks about exists for each one of us as well. And that through this week of inspiration and through our efforts to carry that inspiration and knowledge back to our homes and continue to apply it to the best of our ability, that plan will more and more unfold, bringing peace and love and joy to our hearts and to others, even in the midst of our inevitable tests and adversities. So Jai Guru, Jai Ma, Jai all of us. <laughs>